folks, Pastor Bob asked me to do a Bible study for you tonight for your Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, so he told me that uh, you've been going through the uh, studies looking at different uh, apostles. I understand prim primarily the 12 apostles, the uh, original disciples of the Lord Jesus. And so... Um, the one I watched was last week, which in which he uh, talked about uh, the Apostle Thomas, who's known as Doubting Thomas, and Pastor Bob talked to you about that and said we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't uh, apply that negative uh, way of thinking to the man. We should give him the benefit of the doubt because he did doubt at a certain time, but uh, he, that's not the sum of his life. He he also was a believer. Well, Bob asked me to talk about another disciple, and that was Judas Iscariot. And I'm afraid to say that uh, he has a very bad reputation, too, but I can't tell you, like Bob did about uh, Thomas, that it's not, uh, you know, deserved. It's not a deserved reputation that Judas has. He has a bad reputation for a reason, and I'm afraid I can't tell you that you shouldn't think badly of him because Judas is the one who is famous for betraying the Lord Jesus. Now, what I want to do is I'll follow the same kind of pattern that uh, that Bob followed, and I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures tonight. Uh, there's actually quite a few scriptures that talk about Judas, believe it or not. The first one that I found was Matthew 10:4. And there it talks about how Jesus spent all night praying and then he chose his first disciple. So he very carefully, by the, by the uh, guidance and the wisdom of God, after a long time of concentrated prayer, he came to the decision as to who should be his first disciples. And one of those that he himself chose was Judas Iscariot. And right there in chapter 10 of Matthew in verse 4, it mentions that Judas was the one who would betray him. And so very interesting. At the very first mention of the man, uh, we're also told that he was going to be a traitor. And so I'm afraid you can't get away from that uh, reputation, that terrible Black mark against the name of Judas. He's known as the traitor, the betrayer. And of course, in that same chapter, though, it goes on to uh, the Lord Jesus does to send out his first disciples to to preach the gospel and to heal the sick and you know lay hands on them and cast out demons and so forth. And that's right after it mentions Judas. So that makes us think or understand that Judas, too, must have been one of those who in those early days went about to all the different villages and so forth and towns around there preaching the gospel and doing the things the Lord had uh, commanded him to do. And we would uh, be right, I think, to, to believe and understand that Judas probably did miracles as well. The Lord used him to do miracles. And that's why uh, an earlier chapter, Matthew 7, verse 22, is kind of interesting because there Jesus himself said that many people would say on Judgment Day, Lord, Lord, did we not, you know, heal the sick and do miracles in your name? And uh, Jesus will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And so certainly it seems like Judas Iscariot must be one of those who fits in that category that was able to do miracles in the name of the Lord and preach the gospel and so forth. But he never really knew the Lord. He was never really in right relationship with him. He didn't really understand what the Lord Jesus' kingdom was all about. It's kind of perplexing, isn't it? Kind of even frightening perhaps that there could be a person like that who who could pray for the sick who could preach a message who could who could uh, do signs and wonders and yet not really know the Lord Jesus that he was preaching not really understand what the kingdom was about 
Now I'm going to give you some scriptures, uh, kind of like uh, we'll do like a harmony of scriptures, bringing them from all four gospels, because those are the only records we have about Judas. But it's interesting that in John 6:64, the Bible says clearly that Jesus knew from the beginning who would betray him. So he prayed all night and he chose Judas knowing he would betray him. And in verse 70 of that same chapter 6, Jesus said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? And so he knew he was going to betray him. He knew that he was a devil. He knew that Judas was certainly a man who was going to end up letting himself be influenced by the devil. And John goes on to tell us in John 13, 2, that it was the devil who had prompted Jesus, prompted Judas to betray Jesus. So he was working on him, working on his mind, getting him to think these thoughts, tempting him with this, prompting him to think like this, that he should betray the Lord Jesus. Matthew 26, 14 tells us that he went to the chief priests and negotiated with them to betray the Lord. Luke 22, 3 says that Satan entered into him and inspired him to do that, to go to those chief priests. Satan was working on his mind in some way. We don't know how, but from our own experience, you know, he usually works within your mind, doesn't he? Projecting thoughts into your mind, suggesting things to you, perhaps inspiring people around you to say things to you that, that are wrong and that lead you the wrong direction. So the, the devil definitely was at work in this man for some time before the actual betrayal took place. We don't know exactly how long, but when it came to the very last day there, when they had the last supper together, Jesus told all his disciples, Judas being present, that they one of them was going to betray him. And of course, you know that they all alike said, is it I, Lord? And, um, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of sermons in that. Like, I think any honest person has got to recognize the fact that we are all sinners. We may love the Lord, but we know there's potential for wrongdoing within us, potential to sin, potential to be led astray. We all know that. That's why they all said, is it I, Lord? But of course, um, Judas asked that question too knowing what he had already done. He'd already met with the priests and so forth and had gotten the, the, the 30 pieces of silver or the promise of it anyway. And so he said, is it I, Lord, knowing that it was him? And according to the version you read, Jesus answered him, you yourself have said it, or the words are yours. But it's interesting to me that um, the other disciples didn't really suspect Judas. In returning to John again, John 13, 27, uh, Peter asked John to ask Jesus, who is it that's going to betray you? And Jesus said, the one that I'm going to dip the bread in, in the sauce and then give to, it's, he's the one. So then he dipped the bread in the sauce, and John tells us at that point, Satan entered into him. And so uh, was that Satan himself who possessed him? Don't know exactly. Sure sounds like it, doesn't it? And so Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. And uh, he went out and the Bible says it was night, which is a very poignant way of saying that darkness was reigning at that point. Satan was there. So Satan definitely influenced Judas. He's always roaming around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? That's what Peter tells us. But the question is, whom may he devour? Well, Satan can't just devour anybody that he wants to. He can only devour people who let him devour them. <laughs> people who let him influence them, who opened the door, so to speak, to the devil in some kind of way. And so how did uh, Judas do that? How did he open the door to the devil? Well, we'll never probably know for sure in this life. I found one quote I wanted to read to you from Easton's Bible Dictionary. It says, quote, Of the motives that have been assigned, we need not care to fix on any one as that which 
simply led him on. Crime is, for the most part, the result of a hundred motives rushing with bewildering fury through the mind of the criminal. And so, I think that's a good quote, there are all sorts of reasons why Judas may have let this happen. But he certainly became the betrayer and he certainly was influenced by the devil. Now, there's just very few clues in scripture as to what could have made Judas open up to the devil in this way. But one of them is found in the book of John, chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Remember, that's the story about the right before, you know, the week as he was going to go into Jerusalem and, and end up uh, at the end of the week being crucified. He had a supper with uh, Lazarus and uh, Martha and Mary at their house. And a woman came, and Martha, I think it was, or, or Mary, I think it was. And, uh, but she came there, John 12, 4 through 6, and she poured an, she broke an alabaster container and, and, and poured this very expensive ointment on Jesus' feet and wiped her, his feet with her hair. And, um, and uh, this was an act of worship on her part. And uh, Jesus said it was a beautiful thing and that uh, it would always be spoken about it wherever the gospel was preached. So this woman gave something that was worth a year's wages. She, she gave it to the Lord Jesus as an act of worship, wiping his feet with her hair and her tears and this ointment and so forth. And the Bible says there, John tells us that Judas rebuked this woman and he called this beautiful act that she, that she was doing there. He said, why this waste? Can you imagine what a slap in the face that was for the Lord Jesus uh, to say that this extravagant worship was a waste. <laughs> worship is showing how worthy someone is. When we worship, we declare someone's worth. When, G when this lady poured this valuable ointment on Jesus' feet, she was showing his worth to her, his value to her. It was worship. It was beautiful. Jesus was very pleased and said forever after it would be spoken about. But what I want you to see there is that Judas called it a waste and said that uh, it could be given to the poor. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And John says, Judas didn't actually care about the poor. He just was a phony. He said, oh, this could have been given to the poor. But really why he said that was because he, he was the treasurer of the group and he kept the money back and he used to steal from it. And so that's kind of a very interesting insight, you know. Um, so we don't know exactly why he betrayed Jesus, but that's an insight into the fact that he had some serious character flaws, some motivations that were twisted, and those things obviously opened up his life to the influence of Satan. It's amazing to me that somebody could be in the inner circle of the Lord Jesus Christ and yet have such twisted motives, call the worship of the Lord, you know, a waste uh, steal the money that was given by people to, to promote the Lord's ministry. Can you imagine? He had no fear, obviously, of being in the presence of this holy son of God, the Lord Jesus. He didn't fear. He didn't realize that the Lord could see through him, that he knew what he was doing. Can you imagine? It's kind of an audacity. It's kind of a pride. It's kind of a, um, just a blindness. He didn't see who the Lord really was, the one that he was so close to. He really didn't know who he was or else he could have never gotten away with this because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and fear the fear of the Lord is when you know who the Lord is. You just recognize who he is and, and you don't want to displease him. I heard a testimony of John Voight the other night on TV. He spoke, John Voight, the famous actor, he spoke about how the Lord actually spoke to him in an audible voice and caused him to know that he was watching him and that life had a purpose and many other things in this one little encounter. It changed John Voigt's life forever. And he said, you know, once you have an encounter like that, you, you don't want to displease that person. You know they're watching you. And so, you know, I wonder, I mean, if you have any, uh, any kind of revelation of the Lord, eh, you will have a fear of the Lord. You would know that the Lord's watching you. And so Judas just didn't have that. 
All the other apostles, they said, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? And none of them seems to have suspected Judas. He didn't stand out as a traitorous person. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we can't see into the heart. And people can be just totally phony and you can't detect what's going on within their hearts. The, the Lord does, of course, but we can't. Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. And, and John tells us that all, all the disciples thought the Lord was just telling him, go buy something for the feast. And um, another telltale sign is the fact that when Judas betrayed Jesus, it says that he knew about the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus went there a lot. That was one of the places where they had the most intimate fellowship and the Lord taught them things. And they were, they were, it was a place of privacy where just Jesus and the disciples could work together. But Judas knew about it. So he went to the closest, he was in, in, the, in the most inner circle, you know. He was in on all the intimate meetings and the times of teaching and fellowship. He really seemed to be one of the group. He was not different. I mean, he didn't have horns. He didn't look satanic, but he was. Now, there's this one conjecture that some people talk about as to why Judas betrayed Jesus. And it is only conjecture, because we'll just never know. But I got to say, this one's always seemed believable to me, so I'm going to share it with you. In Matthew 27, 3 through 5, it says that when Judas saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse, and then he went back to the chief priest and said, I've sinned in betraying innocent blood. And of course, they said, what's that to us? And we don't care about that, you know. And so then he, he just, he threw the money in the temple and, and then he went and hanged himself. And to me, this is kind of a key verse and it goes along with the conjecture that many commentary, uh, commentary writers have, have put forth there. And it's the idea that Judas betrayed Jesus because he wanted to kind of force his hand. And Judas was a guy who he wanted Jesus to be sort of a political military leader like other messiahs had been you know like the maccabees and so forth who had won victories and had had defeat defeated the oppressors of israel and so he was looking for that kind of a movement and that kind of a messiah who would you know raise up a, a a large group of people and march against the romans and drive them out you know and save israel and so he saw jesus had the potential because the crowds came to him and everything but it just seemed like to him after he stayed with him a while, that Jesus wasn't being, you know, definitive enough. He, he wasn't stepping forward. He wasn't saying, follow me and I'll lead us to victory. He wasn't doing those kind of things. And so Judas became impatient. He's like, what is this guy doing? He's got the potential. The crowds follow him and everything. All he has to say is, come on, let's go. But he's not doing it. He's always lovey-dovey and praying for people and healing them and all that stuff and teaching all this spiritual stuff. But we need a military leader. We need a captain to lead us forward into battle. And so because of that, he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll sell him out. I'll, I'll, I'll get him arrested. And then if he, if he gets in a situation like that where it's like really closing in on him and these guys are going to execute him and he sees that he really doesn't have any way out, he'll have to like do something. He'll use his power somehow. He'll, he'll raise up an army and he'll attack, you know, and he'll, he'll be saved out of the Romans' hands and he'll, and he'll lead us to victory. But you see, of course, Jesus' kingdom is nothing like that. That's not what it's about. And so Jesus had no intentions of being a king or leading an army or anything like that. Not that first time around. He, had to, he came to die for our sins. The first time around, when he comes again, he'll come as a conquering king. But first he had to die for our sins. Well, so when Judas saw that, he's not going to do anything. He, he's not going to do anything. They've got him there. They've arrested him. They're going to kill him. He's not going to do anything. When Judas saw that, he just he just couldn't believe it. He, and he said, I've sinned. I've betrayed innocent blood. Let, let him go. I've done the wrong thing. And of course, they, they don't care. The devil doesn't care. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill Jesus and everybody who follows him. So they laughed at him. And of course, he hanged himself as a result. It's conjecture. It may not be the real case, but it sure seems believable to me. I got to hurry up. My time's almost up. 
But it's interesting to me about uh, the whole thing about the money and how the priests, they picked up those coins that Judas threw and they said, we can't receive these back into the treasury because they're blood money. These coins are blood money. So they were concerned for the poor like Judas. And so they bought a place of burial for foreigners, which had been a potter's field, right? Isn't that hypocritical? It's like the, the people who call for world peace and they say they pray and stuff, all these politicians, and they're phony. That's what these people were. We're going to buy a burial place for foreigners. You murdered the son of God, but you're going to buy a burial place for foreigners, aren't you, goody two-shoes? Anyway, interesting. I don't have much time to explore it with you right now. But Matthew says that the traitor getting 30 pieces of silver for betraying the Lord that that was a fulfillment of a prophecy of Jeremiah. And that causes a lot of consternation for a lot of people because, first of all, it's really clearly a prophecy in Zechariah rather than Jeremiah. Zechariah 11, 12, and 13 plainly talks about 30 pieces of silver uh, being sort of a mockery because it's a low price and so forth. And yet the context of Zechariah doesn't seem to relate to the actions of Judah, so that's kind of mysterious. It, but it does mention the 30 pieces of silver in it, and it says, throw them to the potter. And so it says, I threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter, Zechariah 11, 13. Very interesting. The house of the Lord, that's where Judas was, the temple, but it talks about the potter. Now, the, the Hebrew word is very interesting because potter is yotzer, and treasurer or treasury is otzer. Very little difference there. So some say it's just a misspelling. It means the temple, it means the treasury of the temple. But it's very interesting. Throw to the potter. Throw to the temple. It says that right there. Okay? But why does Matthew say this is a prophecy of Jeremiah if Zechariah is the one who really talked about the 30 pieces of silver and all that and throwing it to the potter? Dr. Michael Brown is a guy that I highly recommend. He's a, he has a PhD in Semitic languages, so he knows the Hebrew very well. This, I have a five-volume set by him, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. And in his book uh, on New Testament Objections to Jesus, he gives an explanation for this that really seems to make a lot of sense to me. He says Matthew knew the Old Testament very, very well. He wasn't making a mistake. He didn't just get it wrong and say Jeremiah when he meant Zechariah. But rather, he did something very subtle here. He knew his Jewish people would be familiar with the 30 pieces of silver prophecy in Zechariah. So he left that unmentioned. But he said the prophecy of Jeremiah because especially like in Jeremiah 18 and 19, there's reference to the potter. First, God calls Jeremiah to go and see a potter and he watches him make a vessel and then he, it's marred in his hand, so he smashes it. And the Lord says, don't I have the right to do that? I'm going to smash Israel because they're marred. I made them good, but they've gone wrong. And then in chapter 19, God actually tells him to buy a vessel from the potter and use it as a visual aid and speak to the people of Israel and smash it and say, this is what, you know, God says, I'm going to smash you. I'm going to destroy you because you've, you've uh, gone off into idolatry, worshiping other gods. And also you've shed innocent blood. And there's several references to the shedding of innocent blood. And so Dr. Brown says that Matthew mentioned Jeremiah in connection with the potter because that would bring his Jewish audience, primarily Jewish audience, it would bring to their minds the whole thing about the potter and Jeremiah and reference to innocent blood and blood money and blood guilt and how Israel had sinned and how the judgment of God was going to be coming upon Israel because of their sins and because they betrayed innocent blood. And so, Matthew, according to Dr. Brown, makes the connection with Jeremiah and the prophecy of Zechariah, the play on words, the potter being Yotzer, and the treasurer being Otzar, and so things like that. And the, the scripture in Zechariah is saying, throw the money to the house of the Lord, to the potter. So it's to show the people of Israel, you're killing the innocent one. 
you're shedding innocent blood. Remember what happened last time you did that. And so it's a warning of the judgment of God to come on Israel, which happened in 70 AD. But it's so interesting. You know, God knew everything. And even that this thing about throw it to the temple and throw it to the potter, how Judas actually threw the money. God knew everything that was going to happen. And Judas hanged himself, and the field that was purchased to bury foreigners came to be called Akeldama, the field of blood, because he hung himself there, and his body burst out. He fell. When the rope broke, he fell below, and his body burst out. In Acts 1, 16 through 25, Peter quotes two Psalms, Psalm 69, 25, and Psalm 109, 8, which he says are predictions of Judas's betrayal. Isn't that something? These songs were written hundreds of years before, and they spoke of this betrayal. Zechariah's prophecy, hundreds of years before. Betrayal. Jeremiah too. God knows exactly what's going to happen, and this really shows his foreknowledge in, in these predictions that he made. But yet, at the same time, folks, it's important to recognize that just because God foreknows something that doesn't mean he causes it to happen. Judas still had free will. He was able to resist the devil, but he didn't want to. Instead, he yielded to that infernal influence. So Matthew 14, 21, Jesus said it would have been better for Judas to have never been born. Oh, it would have been better if he'd never been born. I took a course from Fuller Seminary one time years ago, and the professor actually said he believed Judas is in heaven, that he took communion, and so therefore whoever takes communion, you know, you're in and you're going to go to heaven, and Judas is in heaven. I don't believe that. Jesus wouldn't have said it would be better if you'd have never been born if the guy was in heaven. And of course, Peter says in Acts 125 that Judas left the apostolic band to go where he belongs or go to his own place. And so that, that sounds like hell to me. It'd be better if you'd never been born. That sounds like hell to me. And in another place, in John 17, 12, Jesus called Judas the son of perdition. By the way, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 calls the Antichrist uh, the son of perdition. And in Revelation 17, 8, it says he goes to perdition. So that means a state of final spiritual ruin or damnation. It means hell. It means utter destruction. And so Judas is damned forever. He's, he, he opened himself up to the devil. And he suffered horribly even in this life because he, he was so distraught he hanged himself. But the Bible indicates he's lost forever. And so as I close, I, I guess if there's a lesson to be learned from Judas, it might be that, you know, being a member of some special spiritual group like a church or a choir or a missionary organization or whatever other group you might imagine, that sure doesn't guarantee that you're saved, does it? Doesn't guarantee that you're right with God. I mean, Judas was a member of the most elite spiritual group that's ever existed, the 12 original apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he ended up in total spiritual ruin, total loss. He ended up in perdition. And it would have been better for him to never have been born. Oh, God, how horrible, how frightening. And so, you know, life is an opportunity. According to Acts 17, 17 through 31, God put us here on the earth so that we might all seek for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. We don't all get a personal call and the kind of experiences that Judah got to, Judas got to have. I mean, you know, get to see the Lord Jesus with your own eyes and hear teachings from his own mouth and, and watch all the miracles that he did. The Bible, you know, makes clear that was a special time what, what those people got to see, those early disciples, what Judas got to see. But the Bible also makes it clear that God has given us enough evidence to believe and call out to him today, enough for us to believe in our day. And yet, at the same time, Judas' story to me, makes it obvious that you got to respond to that call 
by truly following the Lord in sincerity and truth and not just thinking that you're in because you prayed some prayer or you go to a church or you're part of some group. Judas probably even did miracles, but his heart wasn't right with God. His heart wasn't right. He didn't guard his heart. He obviously thought Jesus didn't know what he was doing or something, so he had to force his hand. He obviously thought Jesus couldn't see what he was doing when he stole the money from the common funds. You know, there must have been some pride there in his ability to hide his inner thoughts, to hide his corruption from God. God can't see. Jesus can't see. He must have thought that he knew better than God as to what should be done. You should take action. Step up. Lead us in battle, you know. If he thought of that, if that's what, he, if that's what you know, like the conjecture says, if that's true, think of the audacity of that. To think you know better than the Lord Jesus, what should be done. There's pride, there's deceptiveness, there's twisted motives. And they all served to make Judas the weak link that Satan needed. He's always looking for that weak link, you know, so that he can get in, so he can infiltrate, so he can harm a church, harm a family, harm a country. He's always looking for that. Of course, God knew what was going to happen centuries before, but he didn't just allow it to happen. He actually used it for his purposes. He used the enemy to accomplish his own purposes. And yet Judas, he doesn't get any credit for that. What he did was terribly wrong, and it grieved the Lord Jesus Christ himself and brought spiritual ruin to his life forever. What a sad, sad legacy, a sad story. If you read those Psalms I mentioned earlier that Peter refers to, boy, they paint a very bleak picture of what happened to Judas and his family as a result of his betrayal. And so most of the disciples have sins and problems in their lives, but we can end up on a happy note because in the end, the Lord worked in their lives and, and uh, he still used them anyway. And so they bring hope to all of us. Judas is, an, is a negative example. He shows us the terrible things that can happen if we don't guard our hearts and walk in sincerity and truth with the Lord and love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and do his will and nothing else. I hope this uh, serves as an exhortation to you to keep your heart above all things for out of it flow the issues of life. May the Lord bless you richly.